Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The snake deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the snake, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life.
Today in our study of Genesis, we come to the second half of chapter 3. Last week, you will recall, we read about temptation, deceit, and rebellion. Uh, We read about the fall of man. And as we continue in the third chapter of Genesis, we might title today's address, The Result of the Fall, or The Results of the Fall. Uh, Now, the relationship with God and the relationship with evil change in this chapter. It begins with the force of temptation in verse 1. Did God really say? But then it's sort of ratcheted up, and war is officially declared in verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. Now, the Bible never allows us to duck our own responsibilities, but neither does it reduce evil to some sort of cartoon character with horns and a tail. No, this act of rebellion by Adam and Eve has given evil a foothold in our world, so that ever since, it's now part of our human experience. And we know it, don't we? We know it in our own lives. We know it on a personal level. We know that we've all committed wrongs. We've mulled over and plotted and planned things that today we're not entirely proud of. And we often ask ourselves, well, where did that come from? Even where did these thoughts come from? As we've been studying, these forces are the result of the fall, of man's disobedience in that Eden paradise. Uh, Today, I want to suggest that there are three main results of the disobedience of man. We have the immediate result, the approximate result, and finally, the ultimate result. First, the immediate result was that Adam and Eve had an instant sense of guilt. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, you will recall from last week. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. Disobedience, it did bring a certain amount of illumination and knowledge, as the devil said it would, but it wasn't the desirable wisdom which they had been led to expect. Instead, it was a knowledge which covered them with confusion and self-consciousness and shame. They gained experimental knowledge of evil, which God never meant them to have. They now knew that they had done wrong. And before the judgment of God was passed on them, their own conscience accused and condemned them. Well, how did this guilt and and shame reveal itself? Well, first we might say that they were ashamed of themselves. Again, verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. They realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. There seems no need to doubt that this is a literal fact, that they sewed fig leaves together. This is what they did. But it's also a physical symbol of something moral and spiritual. It tells us that The period of innocence was over, and now a period of guilt had come. Guilt brought them uh, this embarrassed sense of their own nakedness, and immediately they began to cover up. Uh, We react, incidentally, in in much the same way when we become aware of our moral nakedness. We make pathetic attempts to cover up. We pretend to be someone else, uh, somebody other than who we really are. We develop some persona, some charming pose, some social facade to hide what we're really like from other people. We may, in fact, degrade or or run down other people in order to increase our sense of self-importance, even hiding from ourselves what we actually know what we're like. But these subterfuges are like aprons of fig leaves. They're flimsy, they're ineffective, they're just camouflage. And next, their shame was made manifest as they hid from God. Not only were they ashamed uh, of themselves, but they hid from God. Again, you'll recall from last week, verses 8 through 10. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. The Lord God who made this earthly paradise and put man in it to enjoy it and to work in it, himself walked in it in the cool of the day. And when the work of Adam's day was over, there was time in the evening for companionship with God. God made man in his own image, giving him spiritual faculties in which he could enjoy fellowship with God. And they enjoyed each other's company. But now Adam and Eve have gone into hiding. The communion with God, which had been so satisfying, now seemed uh, distasteful, even repugnant. They didn't want to meet God. They dared not face Him. They were ashamed. They were afraid. And so they took to their heels and ran in order to hide among the trees of the garden. And among the trees, they heard the Lord's God's voice. Where are you? It's as if 
God their creator was now God the redeemer seeking the lost. Now it's impossible to hide from God. Fig leaves were a poor enough material which to hide behind. The trees of the garden certainly could never hide them from God. And so in our lives, where are we hiding from God? Where are the trees in your garden? As some people hide in, in, in a life of feverish activity. They keep themselves so busy that they don't have any time to, to give thought to God. They don't want to think about God. Oh, maybe someday, they say, after the kids go to college or after I retire, maybe then I'll start to think about God. No, they're hiding in their own bus busyness. Uh, other people hide in, in some worldly philosophy, which they prove to their own satisfaction, that the God they are hiding from just doesn't exist. I tell you, neither the busybody nor the atheist can altogether escape from God. And every now and again, in a time of joy or, or, or sorrow, love, beauty, depression, illness, bereavement, in the face of death, they hear the voice of God. They hear him saying, where are you? And they sort of peek out, frightened behind the uh, protection of their own little trees. And their God is the God that they don't believe in, the God they crowded out of their lives, the God they are anxiously hiding from. The uh, final way they exhibit shame is that Adam and Eve blame each other. When God found them uh, among the trees of the garden, there they stood before him blushing. He asked them the cause of their shame. Who told you that you were naked, he asked. What is the reason for this new self-consciousness? Now, you might expect that God's straightforward question would get a straightforward answer, but no. You might have expected there would be some acknowledgement of sin, a sign of penitence, even a humble plea for forgiveness. Not at all. There is neither a direct answer nor a confession of guilt. Instead, like so many of us, we have excuses. They try to exonerate themselves by blaming someone else. Verse 12, the man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. In other words, it's the woman's fault. And yes, God, it's partially your fault because you gave her to me. Verse 13, then the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the man said, don't blame me, blame her. And the woman said, don't blame me, blame it. And true, the serpent did tempt Eve and Eve did tempt Adam, but the fault and the blame were still their own. How modern this all sounds, doesn't it? And to avoid the, the pain of penitence, we create any conceivable excuse. Well, I've been saddled with this thing my entire life. I couldn't help myself. I was put in uh, an impossible situation. Again, I couldn't help it. And in our generation, we sort of implement the comforting doctrine of what is called diminished responsibility so that we could placate our own troubled conscience. It's not me. We have this deep, uh, deep reluctance to acknowledge our own guilt. And so the simplest device, if you want to call it that, is to blame someone else. Be the victim. It's not my fault. It's his or hers or it's or theirs. It's society's fault. A simple transference from me to somebody else. Uh, identifying today as a victim is now seen as a virtue. Yet no man is ever restored to God who does not come to himself like the prodigal son and then come to the father and say, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and I'm not worthy to be called your son. Who, who doesn't admit humbly that it was my fault, my own fault, my own mess. This then is the sense of guilt. The first consequence of the fall of man, it makes us first try to cover ourselves up, then to hide from God and then to blame each other. Secondly, we have the approximate result of man's fall through disobedience. The approximate result was the sentence of divine judgment. So far, it's as if we've been witnessing the trial of Adam and Eve, and now comes the judgment. The three actors in the dreadful drama of man's fall, they come under the judgment of the Lord God one by one in order in which they appeared on the stage. They hear each their sentence pronounced. We have a sentence uh, on the serpent, verses 14 and 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. 
and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. We have no time to delve into the question about how much this curse of God upon the serpent is literal. Uh, Humans do, in fact, seem to have an aversion to snakes, but we don't know what creature this precisely was. Uh, Also, it's very doubtful if we're meant to understand that before the fall, that no snake had ever crawled on its belly in the dust. What is clear is that behind this serpent was the serpent of the devil, and therefore behind God's curse on the serpent was his judgment upon the devil. It is the devil's head which was going to be bruised or crushed under the foot of the woman's seed, as we will see later. Uh, Now in verse 16, we have the woman's sentence. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Well, let's look at the first part of this. I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. Unlike the words he addresses to Adam and to the serpent, God does not use the word curse in addressing the woman. While the woman is punished, She was not cursed. Also, God does not say that he will create pain in childbirth, but he will will multiply it. Um, He will make it more severe, suggesting that, in fact, some pain would have accompanied childbirth even in paradise. Uh, Essentially, God is telling both man and woman that he would no longer protect them from the harshness of nature. Uh, So I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Understandably, this verse disturbs many people in our present age. Uh, The modern ideal is that the woman ought never depend on, let alone have an urge, for a man or a husband. Uh, A well-known feminist slogan of the 1960s puts it this way, a woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle. Uh, And to be sure, a certain percentage of women do not yearn for a man, And even though much of contemporary thinking denies this urge, you don't need a man, never be dependent on anyone. Even though much of contemporary thinking denies this, most women want a man to love and to receive love from. Here we see yet another reality resulting from the fall. It's not necessarily a curse nor a punishment. It's certainly not a command. It's a description of what will take place in the real world. And now the sentence given to the man, verses 17 through 19. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Man receives a double sentence. First, because he is because he has eaten of the forbidden fruit, the ground was now cursed. Although he will continue to eat of the plants of the field and and bread from the ground, yet thorns and thistles will frustrate his cultivation of the soil. At first, Adam's great pleasure and privilege was working in partnership with God, but now it would involve his own toil and sweat, and this would last all the days of his life. Uh, That frustration is still present. I mean, we may have moved from uh, an agrarian economy to an industrial economy, but you know technology has just changed the form by which the ground exerts its curse on humanity. One author writes this, those who once sweated with aching backs behind a heavy plow now stand beside a conveyor belt, tightening a million identical nuts and bolts where the power of their bodies may have grown soft, but their minds are weary with the weight of emptiness. You don't have to work on a conveyor belt or in a sweatshop, I imagine few of us do, to know the frustration of work. Those kind of days at work where you think to yourself, surely this is not what life was meant to be. It was meant to be something different. Uh, Second, at the end of his life, Adam's body would return from the ground to which it had been taken. 
Now, God had a nobler end to humanity than death. Death, the decay and the disillusion, the, the decomposition of the body was quite suitable for the animals and for vegetation. But for man, made in the image of God, death would have been inappropriate, even undignified. There seems little doubt that God's original purpose was to take man to heaven by means of something other than death. Perhaps like uh, we read of, of Elijah and Enoch, they were translated into heaven. But now the human race would be degraded. We were to share the same fate as the animals. Man will die, his body return to the dust. God had said, if you eat of the tree, you will die. This does not mean that the human species would die out. Uh, Adam says in the next verse, verse 20, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. They would continue to live for a time, but then they would die, for the human body was now mortal. So far we've seen the sentence of the serpent, the sentence of the woman, the sentence of the man, and now we read of the sentence of Adam and Eve together, uh, starting at verse 22. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and, flaming so and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So far, we have considered, first, the immediate result of the fall, secondly, the approximate result of, of man's disobedience, and finally, we come to the ultimate result of the fall of man's disobedience, and that is the promise of deliverance. To me, it's such a, an amazing, a marvelous thing that in this very section where God passes judgment on humanity, he also promises salvation. That God is a God of wrath and a God of love. He's a God of justice and a God of mercy. A, a God of judgment and a God of salvation. Our judge has indeed become our Savior. Through salvation, Christ is, is foretold and foreshadowed for the first time right here in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. This is known as the Proto-Evangelium. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, the seed of the woman is, is not difficult to recognize. It's Jesus Christ, who was born of Mary herself, descended from Adam and Eve. Jesus Christ, in his flesh, is the seed of the woman, a descendant of Eve. Eve had succumbed to the devil's enticement, and so through the woman's seed, Christ would overthrow him. But for now, we must live with these final two verses in this section. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. From that moment on, we've been on the outside looking in. We've been trying to cheat death. We've been trying to conquer the grave itself. We've been trying to extend life, our ingenuity, our cleverness, our ability, all of this to perpetuate a life in exile, a life without God. But the whole project, of course, is just madness. I have seen the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, wrote Allen Ginsberg. And the first great message of the gospel, in a sense, is just to say this, that a life without God is madness. It's something which is utterly and absolutely impossible. Listen again. God drove the man out, and he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. God knows man, and he knows sinful man. He knew that if he expelled man from the garden, that man would say, oh, if I can only just get back in there, if I can only just eat one piece of fruit from that tree of life, I will live forever. If only I could just get in. And so God places cherubim in the flaming sword, guarding the entrance to the tree of life. So what does this mean? This 
is the position of humanity today. This is the explanation of the fact that in spite of all the culture and all the philosophizing and all the thinking and all the social action, and all the politics and all the, the, the wars of 2,000 years and more, man is as he is today because he's still outside. He can't get back in. Why not? Why, it's the cherubim and the flaming sword. Whether you like it or not, it's the fact. You may be trying to get in, but no one could get in. The cherubim, the flaming sword, what does it mean? Oh, what are the cherubim? Well, the cherubim are there to indicate and to represent the presence and the unapproachability of Almighty God. Go through your Bible and look at every reference to the cherubim. You'll always find that they're used to depict and represent the glory and the majesty, the might. They represent the presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant, keeping the tablets of the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God. On top of that box was this kind of covering, and that covering led up to two cherubim. And the cherubim were looking down uh, upon which was called the mercy seat, this kind of lid uh, beneath which contained the law of God. It is, you see, the representation of God's holiness, the expression of God's holy nature. And then God places these cherubim at the east gate, the entry into the Garden of Eden, through which he had just expelled the human race. So what this means, you see, is this, that whenever man tries to come back to enter the unknown, to uh, obtain the blessings of life and of joy and of peace, he comes immediately face to face with the everlasting and eternal God, the God who is light in whom there is no darkness at all. We read of all those who had come anywhere near him or even uh, just caught a glimpse of his glory. They fall down. They're helpless. They don't know what to do with themselves. The cherubim represent the ineffable glory of God. And what else? Well, the flaming sword. The flaming sword flashing back and forth, turning every which way, downwards, upwards, left, right, it's everywhere, turning around, and you'll never escape it. You'll never avoid it. And what is this? This is nothing but the wrath of God against sin. And there's nothing more important for us to realize than just that. Do you want life? Do you want happiness? Do you want peace? Uh, are these the blessings that you seek? Well, you will never have them until you've passed God in his rage against sin. They're behind him. You've got to get past God. You've got to get past the sword of his wrath. And the human tragedy is that we've been trying to do this with our own strength, our own learning, our own ability, our own morality. But it's useless. And why is this the case? Because we're not passing God. We're not dealing with the sword. We can't get in. It is, my friend, the folly of sin. So, are, are we hopeless? Is the message of Christianity that man individually and as a species is doomed? Are you saying that there is no way to life and peace and joy and all that I stand in need of? Thank God that isn't the message. The message is that there is, in fact, a way into that garden. There is only one, but there is one. And it is to stand in the presence of the glory of God and not be consumed. There is no entry into that paradise without standing before the glory of God and not being consumed. But it is possible. There is one and there is only one who can stand in the presence of God and look into his face of glory. And he is the Son of God. The Son of God who is God himself who shares the same glory. Who came down into this world and took human nature to himself, who was made of flesh and dwelt among us. He identified with us. He came as a human, and as a human, he stands before God and looks into the face of God. But what about the sword? Well, that's the most amazing thing of all. Jesus Christ. Son of God, advanced against a flaming sword and it struck him and it killed him and it broke his body. And in breaking his body, the sword itself broke. And he has opened the way into the paradise of God, to the tree of life, to salvation and all of its indescribable blessings. And through the broken body and the shed blood of the Son of God, you and I could enter into that paradise from which mankind was thrown out. We could take 
of the tree of life and eat abundantly of it. You see, he has made a new way, a living way, and he's done it through his own broken body. There's no way into the paradise of God except through Jesus Christ. If that charging sword of death had defeated him, there would never be an opening, even though he is the Son of God. It wasn't enough for the Son of God to come into the world. It wasn't enough for him to teach us. It wasn't enough for him to live perfectly and to give us a great example. Before we could enter, the sword must do its work, and Christ conquered that for us. So let me urge you, come to Christ. Let Christ put Satan under your feet. Let Christ clothe you with his own righteousness. Let Christ undo in your life these bitter results of man's fall and disobedience. Do you want life? Life which is life indeed. Abundant life which may take you through death to eternity and glory. Do you want peace, joy, and happiness? then stop trying to obtain them with your own strength or by the strength of any other human being or by any knowledge. They've all failed and they're still failing. There is only one way, my friend, and it's Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Through Jesus Christ, the cherubim and the flaming sword have been removed. And now we could enter into the presence of God and to begin to receive those blessings which this world so sadly needs and of which we as faithful servants of God shall continue to enjoy throughout eternity.